It's a great honor for us to be here. Uh, we are uh, from this company called CarePay, and our dream, and we have already started, is to get a mobile, oh, get mobile health insurance, uh, get health insurance on your mobile phone, and uh, that's what we're doing. We're doing this in Africa, and uh, we're really, really making a lot of progress, not because I think we are exceptionally good, but because the need is massive and there is this enormous opportunity to use technology in a different way. Barry will say more about it in the second part of the presentation. I'll first try to share with you a little bit the complexities of health and mobile technology in Africa and then what we're trying to do. So, um, just for you to understand uh, how do you end up on, uh, with, with mobile, uh, tele mobile phones and health insurance, what you need to understand is that um, we are linked to the Academical Medical Center of Amsterdam and our colleagues, my colleagues, they did the mother-child transmission studies in 1995 on HIV-AIDS. They proved that you could prevent the transmission of the disease from mother to child for one dollar a day. And with that, they became world famous. Not many people in the Netherlands know, but this is very true. And then they started, ahead of any public money, they started HIV AIDS treatment programs. And because there was no public money, it was privately financed and it was privately delivered. And for us here in rich OECD countries, healthcare and private is a wrong word. But when there's no alternative, this is probably the only way forward. And with that, they became world famous. We became world famous. And after we did that, we went on to move. Uh, it's strange when you do an expensive disease like HIV AIDS, and when you've broken a leg, you have nothing. So we moved on to health insurance. Then we understood that with health insurance, when there is no doctor in the clinic, there's no medication there, that you have a massive problem because nobody then wants to prepay. So we started to give loans to doctors. We are now one of the largest giving loans to doctors at the bottom of the pyramid. Everybody was saying they will not repay and they will uh, steal the money, but today we have a default rate of less than 3%. And our next dream is to use mobile technology because health insurance was too expensive to go to the low end of the uh, millions of people that need it. Um, so the administrative costs were too high, so we started working on mobile technology. So my presentation today is on that stuff, how we have developed this, where we stand today. And today, just to share it with you, we have millions of people already on the platform and we are expanding very rapidly. That's what my presentation is about. Um, before I tell you where we stand today and the technology, first a little bit of understanding, a bit better understanding of healthcare. I just have a question for you guys here. Who knows here in the Netherlands, a family of four, a family of four, how much you are spending on healthcare? Not as an individual, but just as a citizen. Yeah? Yeah. Anybody has the guts to say this? I, I, I'm, I'm sometimes doing some lectures at the university, never had the right answer. So don't feel embarrassed. Please, somebody. In a single year, huh? In a single year, sorry? Six zero? Sixty thousand? Six thousand, yes. Six thousand, huh? Ten thousand, yes, more. <laughs> Go up, up, up. <laughs> Family of four. 16, 16,000, more. Sorry? 35,000, no, it's less. So then I'll give you the answer. <laughs> sorry, sorry? 25, then you're close, yes? We are spending in the Netherlands, Mickey Mouse place, but it's, it, it, it's everywhere in Europe, basically the same and the same in, 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 in uh, uh, the US and in uh, uh, Japan, etc. We're spending in the Netherlands 90 billion on a population of 17, so let's say 5.5, 22,000, so sir, you're close. 22,000 euros we are spending. So we have this dynamic group here, most of you are a little bit younger. How much do you take out on average? How much do you take out? Maybe two, 3,000? Yeah? Maybe 4,000? When you're chronic sick, you're, some of you maybe probably have a chronic disease, then it's different, but on average, especially when you're younger, younger family, you take out a couple of thousands. So what the hell is happening with that money? <laughs> Old people, it's partly true. 
I should rephrase it and more political correct, but also true. So you're right with the old people, but it's, it, we should rephrase it, I think. It is spent, 70% is spent in the last three months. Yeah? So in, in anybody's life, 70% of that amount, of the 22,000, is spent in the last three months. So it means, it, this means that we are redistributing on a scale here in this room today, I think nobody realizes. For 20, 30 years, you're contributing a much higher amount than what you're taking out. And that requires trust, so you need trust. And that is what I wanted to say in this slide here. We, in OECD countries and all around the world, healthcare is the largest industrial activity that we are doing as human beings. And we're paying massively for each other. Because on a, health is one of those things that you cannot afford it, really, when you have a heart attack, you need others to pay for you, and you need uh, somebody else to take care of you. These are the two market failures of healthcare. That's why it's so, I say it political, incorrect, but it's true, it's damn complex. It is so complex, because you need two things. You need to pay for each other, and you need to share the risk with each other. So you, that, that's number one. So you, need, you cannot choose your buddy. Uh, I can choose a car, but I cannot choose a, my buddy. So I, we have decided all together that we share the risk of disease, we share the age, and we share income, and we redistribute. On a scale I just gave it, I just explained to you. And then the other thing is, who can afford his own hospital? Also. There may be, in the world, three people. The people in Saudi Arabia, this guy that killed some of these people. Uh, it's taped. So, but, uh, 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 the, but this is a real issue. Um, Donald Trump and maybe Kim Jong-un. Yeah? And all others need to share a hospital. So, two big problems. That is that you cannot, as an individual, uh, pay for your own insurance and you cannot pay for your own hospital. So you need to share it with each other. So the best solution to address these market failures, the fact that the cost and the benefits are not united in the same person at the same time, that is the fundamental problem. That issue, the fact that this is happening, the, the, the real solution for that is to go public, to organize it through a public system. And everybody here agrees to that because you guys are smart. It's a little bit political what I'm saying here. But to take it one step further, and we, when, when we say that we want to share healthcare with each other, one step further, who is willing in this room to redistribute 20,000 a year through Brussels for people with a health insurance in Bulgaria? Please, put up your hand if you're willing to do so. Quite a few of you, quite a few of you, yeah? And again, I think this is the reason why people on the tech side have this I would say also real social anchoring, but I've done this with students quite often, not more than three, four, five percent is willing to redistribute by the tens of thousands through Brussels for people in countries that also want to participate in health system. So the trust, the trust that you must have in the entity that redistributes is massive, otherwise you will not do it. Um, and that is reflected in this slide, and that is also the problem of poverty. The problem, the opportunity of good, good public services is that you start to share risk with each other, and if you pay taxes, then everybody benefits. When everybody benefits, everybody uh, has a, is better off. But in developing countries, when you, who has been to a developing country here? A lot of you, yes, okay. So, it, I'm always saying, if you drive out of the, of the airport, you end up at the first roundabout, nobody stops for the traffic light, yeah? If that's the case, then you know that nobody pays taxes. When nobody pays taxes, nothing is shared. And then, this law of health economics kicks in. It means that you are on your own, yeah? So, the poorer you are within a country, the higher the out-of-pocket expenses, the poorer the country is, the higher the out-of-pocket expenses, and the people that need the redistribution most, the most vulnerable in the world, they are on their own. This is what this slide says. It's really important to understand this. And 
because this is happening, nobody has access to health insurance. So these are figures from Africa on total, and the total expenditure in Africa of all healthcare expenditure, only 5.5% is available through health insurance. To put it more precise, you guys are precise, nobody is prepaying. Nobody is prepaying. Everybody waits until it's there and only then they pay. And because nobody is prepaying, you have what we call this vicious cycle of problems. Because nobody is prepaying, nobody is investing. Because nobody is investing, the clinics are empty. There's no medication in there. Why should I prepay if there's nothing there? That is the tragedy of poverty and health. And that is what we are working on with our technology solution. So I just wanted to share this with you so that you have some kind of understanding of what is going on in developing countries. And I've summarized it as follows. Is it possible for us to use technology to move from postpaid to prepaid? Not new money, no, no. Just the deliveries, the malaria cases, the TB cases, the HIV AIDS cases, the broken leg cases, all those cases in developing countries, they are postpaid. You only pay on the moment that you know the fact is there. Nobody is prepaying because of trust problems. Because I pay in to some scheme and the guy, or the, it's often guys, uh, they take the money and they go to Switzerland and buy a house. Enforcement problems. And technology can change this. This is our whole dream and our philosophy. So, before I go into that, I just wanted to share a little bit more on mobile technology in developing countries. Who recognizes this? <laughs> so what do we see here? What do we see here? What is it what we see here? Sorry? They need wireless. Yes, that's definitely true. But that is the solution. What is the problem here? Sorry? Yes. Say that again? They are tapping yeah. electricity here. What you see here is an enforcement problem. It's the same problem on the roundabout. Nobody stops because if the guy comes in, I give him $3 and I'm off the hook. So the same thing is happening here. People think they are smart by, uh, uh, when the guy, by tapping in for free and then they come for a control. I give them one, two, five, ten dollars and then uh, nobody is paying anything and the result is that everybody either gets nothing or sitting home with his own generator. Yeah? And you're not sharing the benefits of technology and efficiency. That is one of the major problems of uh, poverty. So, the SIM card, the SIM card changed that problem that you just saw in a massive way. You guys, you guys are working with that. You are deeply involved, I think, also in mobile. But sometimes the implications of it in real life are misinterpreted or not fully understood, or you look at it through your lens of the environment that you live in yourself. But what happened here, what the SIM card did, it is that it changed a contract. It became possible that you were prepaying. You could only, only access a mobile service if you were prepaying. And then the investor, the investor knew that from that moment on, no collection risk. It cannot be bribed. And therefore, everybody started to invest in these towers in Congo and Nigeria. Nothing has happened there in the last 100 years, and suddenly it's all over the place, and it works on a scale nobody could have ever imagined. So the trust problem of collection was rooted out by technology, by this little card, and suddenly everybody got a phone. And Africa showed, and also in other developing countries, when it works, when it works, when the service is there, people start to prepay. Why not? They are all the same everywhere on the planet. And then a next thing happened, and that is, I think, also really fascinating. If you take your mobile phone and you have your SIM card with your identity, and if I can preload airtime on it, then Vodafone in Kenya was saying, well, you know, if I can do this, then I put value in the system. If I put value on the SIM card, why can I not that? Why can I not also wire it to somebody else? And that was accepted by the central bank. 
And for the first time, everybody with a mobile phone, everybody with a mobile phone, not with this one, everybody with a mobile phone suddenly had a bank account. And there, I have a question again for you because you guys are smart. What is the difference in your opinion? It's a bit of a strange question because you maybe have to give a lecture almost like me. But what is the difference between mobile money and a mobile banking app? Anybody the guts to say this? Yes. Yes, there's a central institution in between, that's one. But there's another big difference, much more important in addition to what you're saying. Your money is located on your phone instead of central system. Yes, really what it does is that you do not need a bank account, you don't need a bank, you do not need an ATM, you do not need a credit card. No, I can just wire value money to any bank account, uh, to any mobile number that somebody had. And that was accepted by the central bank. In other words, you can take money outside of the banking system. And that is what happened in Kenya, and that is that service is called M-Pesa. And M-Pesa is the most widely used tele mobile, uh, 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 mobile money service in the world. Today, it runs 45% of the GDP of Kenya. 40%, 40 to 45% is used by poor people with a mobile SIM card. They don't even have a smartphone. It's a feature phone. And they just SMS each other the money through a central, indeed, uh, ledger that is run uh, by uh, Vodafone and one bank. Yes. Um, so, if that's the case, then you see again here that this SIM card not only gave people connectivity, but it also gave them a bank account. They were suddenly individuals that could transact by the tens of millions in the financial system, and they can be reached. And today, the, it's not anymore this digital thing with on it uh, ABN, EMRO, or ING, or Rabobank. No, it's just a SIM, it's just a text, and it says that you have this value, you show it, then they give you the money. And the other way around, you can just put it, they send an SMS, they put it on a central ledger, and you get a confirmation that this is your money, and people accept it on a massive, massive scale. This trust, when it works, is really completely changing the way people interact with each other. So that is what we have been using, that strength, what we are trying to do, or what not trying, what we are doing, is that with our company, we have a company in Kenya, we have one in Tanzania, we have one in Nigeria, and we are also looking to other places to expand. What we are doing is used, we are using mobile telephony and then on top of that mobile bank accounts, and then we have said if we have those mobile bank accounts, we link them to clinics, we link them to a central uh, uh, contract ledger, and then all payers that are active on health, we unite them through this health exchange, to the clinics, and then when you walk in, you identify yourself, and automatically you can access your health insurance. This is what we're doing. And we have now signed up millions of people already, and I think that this is going to change the world. Maybe we screw up, that might happen, but this technology is coming on a scale, I think, that nobody believes that uh, uh, the, 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 with the speed it is uh, changing things. Um, Basically, and that is my last slide, what you see today is that because of trust issues, the problems of the payers, the payers want to know that their money is going into the patient and not stolen uh, or used for cars or for drinks or anything like that. Everybody on the left side, people that are paying you yourself for your children, your health insurer, your employer, UNICEF, all those active payers, they are today contracting each of them, clinics, and it's a mess, it's a spaghetti thing. And the administrative cost, they run at $20. And to the right, to the right, we have united all those payers through this electronic health exchange, individualized it, you can access it through your mobile phone, and we are running it at a cost of $1.5 today, uh, up to $5 for the more, much more expensive schemes. But today, $1.5, and every life is connected to all these provisioning uh, sites. That is really what we, what we are aiming for, and uh, uh, I think we are onto something, and I wanna now give it on to my colleague, 
to give you much more insight on the, uh, I would say, uh, technology side of this story. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you, Onno. We want to start by showing you a small video. Elikwanga 2016, sikuwa ni mingia kwa ini ni Mtiba. Kuna time nilikuja ni kangozeka, sikuwa na pesa cash. Niliagaika sana, ikabidi nikanda nikakopa mani pesa, nikakopesho, nikatibiwa. Mtiba has been helpful to us. It has helped us in giving healthcare services to our clients, even when they have nothing in their wallet. But they have something in the Mtiba wallet. We are able to give them healthcare services without uh, any hassle. Mtiba minisaidia sana. In a country like Kenya, two out of five people forego medical care because of the cost that they can't afford. Almost half of the healthcare costs in Kenya are paid out of pocket, and about one million people every year fall back into poverty because of health related expenses. If you look at health insurance schemes, they're mostly unaffordable for the masses. So the platform that we are uh, offering, the MTBA platform, was way overdue. The market is screaming for a technology platform that provides transparency and speed of payments and thereby making healthcare much more accessible and better for everyone. So the patient uh, saves a little of uh, what they, they get and when any of the member of the family is sick, so they are able to now uh, get treatment from this facility. Kenya is the home of the uh, most successful mobile money system called M-Pesa. And MTBA, our platform, is built on top of it. In other markets where we are uh, active, like Nigeria and Tanzania, we integrate with other digital payment providers. Our platform makes sure that all the data and money that needs to flow between the three main stakeholders in healthcare, the patient, the provider, and the, the payer, uh, that that money and that data flow seamlessly and by making the data and the money flow seamlessly uh, we generate enormous efficiencies in terms of cost savings but also we are able to get much more real-time data on what is actually happening in the field and that data is helping take much better policy decisions from a public health perspective but also for an insurer for example they can make much more informed decisions about their products their pricing and their distribution strategies for example all right so that's the story of MTBA the name of the platform uh, that we launched in Kenya what I wanted to do now is take you back to the start of uh, the CarePay. When we launched, we knew that we wanted to give a mobile health wallet to uh, members. And we wanted to fix this problem here, that uh, a lot of paperwork was happening with the providers. And uh, uh, submitting a claim was taking about three months. Um, and, and people did not get access to healthcare. So when we started, we didn't start with uh, software development. No, we just bought a pre-existing solution that was already proven and worked in the Netherlands. And it was developed by a Polish software company. And it was written in .NET, and it had a SQL Server database. And since it was already working and it, uh, we knew it was uh, proven, we decided to launch and we launched with a donor wallet. A donor wallet means that people get access to a small amount of money in their wallet and they can only spend it on healthcare. And we would keep track of the financial revenue at the end. Um, this platform was nice, of course, but uh, we wanted to add some more functionalities to the platform. And the Polish software development company it was great, but it was very slow. They write lengthy documents and they use a waterfall approach uh, that would take us months to develop new functionality. So we recruited a software developer in Kenya and this guy um, was straight out of university, knew how to code in PHP and decided to build something with PHP and MySQL. Uh, and the first thing that this uh, developer built was the USSD menu system. You might have seen it in a video, USSD, I'm not sure if people know what it is, but it's anybody with a feature phone can use the USSD, they dial star 253 and you get access to a really simple text-based menu system. And it works for all phones, whether you have a Nokia, a Techno or a smartphone, it doesn't matter, it always works. So this uh, software developer decided to build some uh, new functionality on top of the uh, existing application um, and then we ended up with MySQL and MS SQL database and um, uh, PHP and .NET. Um, 
And at that time, we, we knew that we were onto something. We wanted to scale the system, but if you have, this actually is a picture of the electricity box at one of our providers. Uh, I, I took it myself, and it's really how their electricity system is working. Uh, it, it basically was uh, indicating how our platform was working at the time. Um, and you have the cultural differences between Kenya software developers and people in Poland who write lengthy documents. And we knew that we wanted to change things. We uh, wanted to have a more agile platform. And um, so we decided to write uh, most of the platform in Java and rewrite the whole platform so that we could scale also to other countries because the existing platform would only support one country at a time. Now, while we were doing the rewrite, uh, the system was getting more and more successful, and we had a, a large group of agents who were walking around in the, the slums, in the facilities, to recruit as many people as possible. And, um, and this was actually quite successful. It was actually so successful that we investigated some of the enrollments, and some of the agents were so successful that they were enrolling one person every minute. And we were thinking, oh, that's either they're really brilliant and they're really good at what they're doing, or something else is going on. So we started to investigate the data, and it turns out that these agents um, went to the black market, buy a stack of SIM cards uh, for $45 a piece, and then they were enrolling members, and they got 25 shillings from us. Um, and what they did is that the, um, they injected the SIM cards, Enroll the member onto the SIM card, eject it again. Insert another SIM card, register, eject. And, and, and then when the SIM cards were used, they would sell them again as second-hand SIM cards for 30 cents. So it was quite a good business model for these guys. Um, but it took us a while to figure out what the hell they were doing. Um, but the good news is that at least the platform was getting more and more successful, and we also started to introduce uh, a savings product. So instead of just donor money, we also had a savings wallet where people could save little money as they had, and then the money that they saved they could spend on healthcare at facilities, while donors would top up. So if you pay, let's say you save uh, $2, the donor would pay $1 additional to get people into the habit of saving and prepaying for healthcare, as Ono explained. Um, in the meantime, the migration to the new microservices model, etc., was on the way. And at some point, we decided, let's migrate now. Uh, now is the time. Uh, we really want to get this new platform up and running. And it had to be a big bang migration, because we had one monolith database written in PHP, the other one in .NET, and we wanted to split out across multiple databases. So we, we planned a weekend of uh, eight hours of downtime to do the migration. And this guy is one of our developers. He, he was actually already up for 24 hours, and he took a nap, and somebody, somebody took a snapshot of him. But uh, the migration was a lot more difficult than we anticipated. Um, after the migration, we found out we still had a lot of bugs, and we had to work for 48 hours in a row just to get the system back online again. But in the end, hey, we had a Java-based system built out of microservices. Um, at the same time, 2017, we... Um, were contracted by the government to do something called universal health coverage. Now, what that means is that the government contracted us to do a launch into three counties, three provinces of Kenya, to uh, enroll everybody who is living in the county onto their universal health care cover, um, which is great. It was a nice contract for us, and um, it was a bit of a challenge because in a really short time frame, we were enrolling a lot, a lot of people. And the agents um, who were doing the enrollments for us they didn't want to pay for the traffic from their own airtime bundle. Uh, so we made a deal with Safaricom, the telecom operator, that we would give them free uh, data, but only to our servers. So we decided to run everything on one single server that would act as a proxy to route the traffic back to the Amazon environment where we were running everything. Um, but little did we know that we had football fields, really literally football fields full of people being uh, enrolled into this program. And all of that traffic was going over one small connection to Safaricom. So in the end, that uh, connection was completely clogged up and, uh, and we had to scramble to, uh, to find a solution to that. Once we did, the next day we um, ran into another snag. Um, the pictures that we take from the uh, passports we built an API built on uh, Google uh, Vision API to be able to extract uh, date of birth, uh, first name, last name, uh, ID number, etc., to extract that from the picture. 
Now, Google charges just a small amount of money for each OCR session that you do. But if you have 10,000 of people a day that you enroll, uh, the bill actually piles up quite quickly. Um, so what we ended up is uh, having downtime, and the downtime was caused by the fact that our credit card was maxed out. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, we found another credit card, and we were able to uh, get back on track uh, quite quickly, fortunately. But it was a really nice experience to see how many people you can enroll in a short time frame. Um, at about the same time, we also uh, were launching some pilots in Tanzania and in Nigeria. And uh, Kenya, um, we made a deal with a telecom operator, and Kenya is quite good in their connectivity. Uh, the, the 3G connection is quite good, and they have coverage nationwide. Tanzania, not so much. Um, in Tanzania, the uh, agents were walking around in the slums and in the areas where there was literally no connection at all. So we had to uh, make some extensions to the agent app to make sure that uh, when you do enrollments, it would store all the pictures and the enrollment data on the app itself. And then in the evening, when you do get connection, we could uh, streamline data back. And the same also for the healthcare providers. Um, in Kenya, healthcare providers have a pretty good coverage. In, in Tanzania, we had to make the system work offline. And that's where the trust issue that Ono mentioned comes back, because we were able to uh, at least get people to trust the system just by showing a text message to your healthcare provider, they are able to treat you. And, uh, and even if you're not able to uh, start a treatment, the healthcare provider would be able to do it on your behalf and you could still get treatment. Because the last thing that we want to prevent is people from showing up at the hospital uh, without being able to access healthcare. I mean, uh, that's what we built the system for in the end. Um, in Kenya, we also uh, made a deal with some private insurance companies, which for us as a company is really good, because instead of just focusing on the poor people and the public health care, we could also spend some time on the people that have a, um, a, a contract paid by their employer. Uh, but if it's private insurance, the private insurers, they have one um, rule. They want to be able to know who they are treating. And if it's your own savings, then there's no risk involved, so it's okay. But if it's uh, an insurance company paying for you, um, they need to have proof that you're treating your own son and not the kid of the neighbor, for example. So we introduced biometrics, where people, when they enroll, we also capture their fingerprint. Um, and when you're at the hospital, you can verify the same fingerprint just to verify that this is indeed the right person. And when we launched, we were looking at fingerprint devices, and we thought, this is a really great device. It's Bluetooth, it's wireless, uh, it's got a battery, so let's use this fingerprint reader uh, also in the clinics. But you can see here on the picture that in the hospitals, um, the cashier is behind bars. And, uh, and the reason why hospitals in Kenya have bars is not to keep bad people out, but to keep the patients in, because you're only allowed to leave once your hospital bill has been fully cleared. So, it turns out that those wireless devices, they got lost. They were stolen, they, they, they just weren't working. And uh, it, when the patient does show up to get treatment, they couldn't find the device. So we ended up replacing the whole infrastructure with wired devices. So at least when you are at the hospital, the, the USB reader is always there. Um, then finally, some numbers of where we are. I think Ono also mentioned it. Currently, we're active in three countries. We have a development team in Kenya who worked on uh, the software. We recently also launched a development team here in Amsterdam. So the teams in Amsterdam and in Kenya are cooperating, and they're building this platform. And from Kenya and Amsterdam, we are deploying into Nigeria, Tanzania, and in Kenya. Uh, currently, we have 4.5 million lives on the system. Uh, currently contracted about 1,200 providers across those th uh, three countries. And this is interesting, the average turnaround time for a claim in Kenya, it used to be about two to three months, because you had to fill in the paperwork, you had to submit it, the courier would need to collect it, the insurance company would have to review it and approve it. If there's a dispute, you have to send it back. Average turnaround time for claims in our system is about 48 hours. That means that the moment that the provider submits the claim, within 48 hours, the provider gets access to their um, uh, due amount. And the total transaction value is currently 29 million on the entire platform.
uh, we've impacted already more than 4.5 million lives, which is the number of people who are now connected to the MTBA platform. We are connected to uh, over 1,100 hospitals and clinics all over the country. And we have already processed more than $24 million worth of transactions, mostly very small denomination transactions. We really see a bright future for our service all over Africa, but if I look at uh, Asia and even to, uh, let's say, the developed world, quote unquote, there's a big need for solutions like ours. Thank you very much.